We have now come to session two, the pleasure of God's trust. That's what rest is. Rest and trust are related words. Unless we learn how to trust God, we're not going to be able to rest in Him or rest at all. I'd like to talk a little bit about my father. You have here a picture of my father and his wife, my mother. And uh, this is during the war, of course, World War II. That's not the significant point of my illustration. My father was a man that was well respected in his community. He was an entrepreneur, a businessman, who worked very hard to develop a company. When he died at age 85, the newspaper read something like this. A man of integrity, a man of generosity, creativity dies at age 85. And many people from the community came out to view him and to uh, support us in the grieving process. For five hours, people came and expressed their love and uh, expressed uh, with us the, the grief, the loss of my father. For two hours, people from the company came by to do so. Then three hours, people from the community. And in that group of people, there were those who worked for him once upon a time, but went off to establish their own businesses and own, own careers. And they said again and again, if it wasn't for your father, I wouldn't have had such a good start in my job, in my career, in my work. But the amazing thing is that there were several people who came to show the respects, the regards to this a man that they loved, even though he had dismissed them from work. He had fired them. And that too turned out to be good for them because they learned much from it. But if my father had a flaw, it was that he was very trusting, trusting. And this meant that a lot of people found ways to take advantage of him. He would establish a business partnership with a man, and they would go and work together for a time. But then that man would take his segment of, his, of the business that had grown and take money and say, I'm leaving now, I'm parting ways. And they would take that money and begin their own business or do something else with it. And so they bit off, we could say, a portion of my father's business. And this happened more than once. And I remember the, uh, the grief, the, the grieving, the uh, hard lines in his face over the years because this had happened. Yet he continued to do that, to trust people, because there were there those who made good on his trust. Some of them were often very poor people that he helped get on their feet, be established, and develop and buy a home and, and have a way of life. And they made good on his trust because he lent them a hand and helped them. And uh, over the years, these people became very loyal. But every once in a while, there'd be persons that appeared to be loyal, but then for their own self-interest would take and break off and run and do their own thing. I remember one individual who was uh, quite a poor person who had been in trouble. He was uh, hired by my father, and my father, so to speak, took him from a very poor lifestyle and gave him a good job. But in time, this person went back to their own ways, and they stole from my father. They stole money. And uh, of course, he was no longer to be employed. Uh, but again and again, my father continued to trust. Now, I remember a man in seminary that was like that as well. He was the head of a seminary where I attend, attended, and his name was Kenneth Conser. And he said, I've made some mistakes in my years. I've trusted people maybe to a fault. But I've also found that as I trusted some people, it gave them an opportunity to grow, to grow in Christ, to grow in opportunity. And it's the same kind of person like my father, who said, I would do it again even if I lost money, even if I lost friends, because there are those who make good on my trust. I offer them an opportunity. Some will take advantage of it. Others will make good and do well with that trust. 
Now I say all this by way of introduction that we might understand that God trusts us, gives us opportunities, and some of us will make good on that trust. We will do what God expect, expects of us. Others will have to learn by mistake again and again to take that trust and then break that trust. And so we come to uh, Exodus chapter 16, the first chapter that the word Sabbath is actually used. Before this time, simply uh, the word rest was tied up in the word seventh day. So we come to Exodus chapter 16. Verse 29 says, bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. This chapter is about trust, making good on God's trust. What will we do with the opportunities God gives us? Will we trust him and obey what he says or will we do what we think is best? The book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, and without faith, which is the same thing as trust, without faith it is impossible to please God. So I've titled this session, Session 2, Rest, the Pleasure of His Trust. God takes great pleasure when we trust Him, and trust must happen in order for us to rest. Now, besides reading and studying the material or the text itself, and what it has to say to us, I like to teach a Bible study method. For years I have taught people how to study Bible in a very simple method. And what I ask people to do is they read or hear a text being read to list key repeated words. You might take a pen, pencil out, and as you have this text either in your Bible or in written form on a piece of paper, you list the words that are repeated key repeated words or phrases. And you see how often they occur. And I'll give you an example of this in just a few moments. And then identify a verse or two that best summarizes the passage. Sometimes it's very obvious that a verse stands out and it seems to say everything in summary fashion or form of what the text, the chapter, or the book of the Bible is saying. Sometimes you have to work very hard and it is uh, necessary to take uh, several verses together and to form what we call a summary sentence that describes the passage. So we're going to begin looking at this text uh, by reading it. And I'm again going to ask my wife Lois to assist me by simply reading uh, not the whole chapter. We could read the whole chapter. I'll allow you to read the earlier verses on your own, but we're going to start with verse 21 of Exodus chapter 16. Each morning everyone gathered as much as he needed, and when the sun grew hot it melted away. On the sixth day they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now note as we have just heard this text, the number of words that are repeated. There are several of them. 
One of them is the word gathered, and we're going to talk about the word gathered uh, uh, in just a few moments. But you see it there in verse 21 and verse 22, the word gathered and so forth throughout this text. And then you see another word, it's the word rest, but we could put together with the word rest the word Sabbath because it means rest. So we could list together rest, the word Sabbath, and day of rest, and put those all together, and we see that those words uh, are very common and connected to each other, and, and so that becomes another category or phrase. And the text goes on to talk about commands. We see that Moses has commanded in verse 23. And again, verse 24 commands, the, God, the Lord has given a word uh, to Moses, and he is to command the people to respond accordingly. It's in verse 28 as well. And then the word gives or given is found a few times as well, especially in verse 29, uh, which we've read already twice, in fact, and it's there in that verse twice. So we have words like gathered, commanded, Sabbath, uh, rest, uh, given, and so forth. Seventh day, again, is a form of the word Sabbath or rest as well. Now, what are we going to do with all these words? Well, we try to find a verse that best summarizes this particular, particular text, a, a verse that seems to put it all together. And a key verse, summary sentence for this passage, uh, I, I see that verse 29, which I've read at the beginning, is more or less a summary verse of what bears in, what goes on in this text and it begins with the word bear. Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath, the day of rest. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So it, much, it pretty much summarizes what has taken place. The Lord has commanded, the Lord has given a day of rest. And in that day of rest, you'll be given enough bread or manna the sixth day so that you don't have to go out and gather. In fact, if you go out and gather on the seventh day, you'll find none. And in fact, you have not obeyed God if you go out and uh, look for it on the seventh day. There's a miracle that happens with that day as well. And that is, see, every other day, if they gathered too much manna, it would not uh, be stored, it would not stay fresh for the next day. In fact, it would stink. It would smell. It would rot, and the, the maggots would come all over it. So if you hoarded, if you took a lot of manna on one given day, and it wasn't the sixth day, you'd find that it would begin to smell, and, and maggots would come into the bread and, and so forth and devour it. And you can imagine from tent to tent, you could more or less tell who had disobeyed the Lord by gathering too much and trying to save it for the next day. You might say, as you step out of your tent, that's an awful smell. Where's it coming from? It's coming from two tents down. Oh, uh, uh, that family again has gathered too much manna, more than they could eat, and now it is rotting on them. When will they obey? and learn to just take enough for what they need for that given day. It reminds us of the part of the Lord's Prayer, give us this day as we, uh, give us this day our daily bread, and uh, just enough for each. For some, they would cause a stink by keeping too much, and it would be bothersome to the community. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. But on that sixth day, God provided a miracle whereby they could, they could save it and they wouldn't have to gather and they wouldn't be able to gather outside of their tents the uh, dew formed or the manna that came out of heaven would not be there on the seventh day, and God provided for them on the previous day, the sixth day, so that they would have enough for both days. So you get the idea that you select a verse that will somewhat summarize the passage, 
And along with that, it's good to enter the discipline of making a summary sentence. This may not be the best or a perfect summary sentence, but here's my attempt at it with this passage. The Lord gave the Sabbath as a gift of rest and a reminder to trust His provision. You can find that the word give or gave uh, is in the text, and it's also here. The word Sabbath is in the text, it's also here, so these are key repeated words. Uh, and rest, of course, that's there as well. It's a reminder to trust His provision. The whole idea of trust is implicit with the text. It's the idea behind it, though the word trust is not specifically cited a number of times. And you get the picture. So it's worthwhile to go through a Bible study discipline so you can learn how to study the Bible on your own with not, so you don't always need a pastor or preacher. In fact, as a minister, if I'm having any difficulty understanding a text, I use this very simple Bible study method, repeating, uh, finding key repeated words, uh, finding one verse that seems to best represent the whole text, and also coming up with a summary sentence that uh, represents the text well.